from the Campus Kitchen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Is this anybody's first time here? Cool. Um, so just a little bit about us. We are a botanical dispensary dedicated to the power of plants, and we're part of Evolver, which is a larger community for conscious living. Uh, we have tons of events here, so be sure to check that out on our website. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine McLean, Britta Love, Lily K. Ross, Dimitri Mugianis, and calling in, we have Sidra Mayasita and Oriana Mayorga. This is Male Supremacy and the Psychedelic Patriarchy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, Britta and I decided that logistics belong outside of the ceremonial space, so I'll just quickly go through some logistics and then Britta will help open the space for all of us to feel safe and supported. Uh, so I printed out some copies of the safety guidelines for engaging with psychedelics and entheogens in a ceremonial space. There are printouts right there. They're not for everyone. Please take one. If you're not going to use it, please pass it on to someone who could use it. And um, you can also find more resources at visionarycongress.org. So the Women's Visionary Congress has been smashing the patriarchy uh, for a long, long time. And uh, we're going to probably include them in one of our future conversations. They're, they're all out on the West Coast. So this is a safe space. Uh, we're going to prioritize sharing of personal stories tonight, which means that you can speak from direct experience. Uh, the parameters for that are up to you, and you can also ask not to be included in the film. We can edit out any of your identity. Um, if you want your voice to be included but not your image, it might be a little bit more difficult, but uh, please either share as you wish or let us know after the fact if you don't want to be included in any public filming. Um, can I also ask, are there any journalists in the room? Okay, Let's thanks. <laughs> okay, so great. So there's one, and I just want to make sure everyone's aware. And if you could just come and talk to us at the end mm -hmm. so we can kind of see how you want to write about it or kind of what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. um, this is not, the intention of this event is not to necessarily out anyone, although the one form of outing that I would actively encourage is if anyone wants to stand up and out themselves and apologize to everyone in the room. <laughs> that would be awesome. And then we could use that as a model for uh, everyone else all over the world who doesn't really know how to do this because this is new. And I think that's pretty much it for logistics. We'll basically do the panel for the first half and then we'll open it up to Q&A, but primarily if people in the audience who want to share about their own experiences and seek some com community support, uh, we want to be able to support that and give enough time for it. Oh, Britta, please. Thank you. So I thought we could maybe take a moment to um, sit and maybe feel our feet on the floor and like fully arrive here. And take some slow, deep breaths. And releasing anything from the day that this come into the space with us that we don't need here. And the intention is for this to be a safe space, but um, as my friend Bones always reminds me, there are only ever safer spaces, so I want everyone to feel they have permission if they are triggered at any point, if stories that are being shared are really intense to take care of yourselves and, um, and do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. So we can take this moment to um, to invite the kind of receptivity that we need to have this kind of discussion. Um, there will be emotional content, there will be triggering topics, and it's so easy for us to collectively to respond defensively to things that are painful to hear. So just taking this moment to invite open-heartedness, to invite vulnerability, to invite being okay with feeling criticized or wrong, and um, to, for us all to really take joy in being in that space together. Um, and maybe to invite a little masculine energy into that, Dimitri, would you like to do a little, <laughs> little masculine invitation blessing? Sure. <laughs> Token mouth. I was in my space there. Um, <laughs> I just want to open up to my ancestors, to all our ancestors in the male and female, and all of us caught up on our grandmothers and grandfathers. And I just want to acknowledge that my grandfather's pain was carried on through me, and I've 
imparted it to others, including women. So I want to ask that those grandfather energies be a part of this healing. Okay. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stand up for this beginning portion, which is a bit of a framing and introduction. And then we'll move into each of the panelists sharing uh, the way that they feel comfortable sharing, which could include personal stories, as well as their kind of more general perspective on a lot of these complicated issues. So I have a quote that uh, I told myself quite a lot after I left my academic position. It's attributed to Mark Twain, but he probably never said it. And it's, if you always tell the truth, you never have to remember anything. And so I'd like to do my best tonight to not have to remember anything. But Lily Tomlin had a funnier way of saying it that's actually more appropriate for the psychedelic space, which is the best mind-altering drug is truth. So a lot of this conversation is difficult. It's complicated. It involves people that we love and care about and have done great things for us. And it also involves people who've done terrible things. And the truth involves paradox. It involves things that don't seem to go together or actually going together, and that's how life works. So tonight we're going to practice kind of radical truth-telling. And, and I think Sita and Oriana, if you just want to mute yourselves, just for the, yeah, perfect. Otherwise we'll be right in the room with you, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> So this is an act of radical truth-telling. Some of the people who are on the panel have never really had the opportunity to speak publicly in a very simple way before. Some people have had the opportunity to speak publicly, but potentially they've censored themselves or felt that they weren't safe enough to do so. And there are people who were invited to this panel who didn't come because they were still scared for their personal lives, their professional lives, and the community just generally not being ready to support them coming out. And so this is kind of the state of where we are. It's not perfect, it will be messy, but we're gonna do it. So I'm a scientist and I want to start with some numbers. 90% of all the board members and directors and scientific advisors of the top funding agencies for all psychedelic research all over the world are white men. Even Beckley Foundation, which was founded and directed by a woman, has 18 out of 19 advisors as men. Founded in 2014, MAPS B Corps, which is sponsoring the MDMA trials for PTSD, is actually a huge shift in that domain. 12 out of 14 of its clinical and research directors are women, but the board of directors is still comprised completely of white men. Just recently, there was a survey made public by an academic woman who left academia and she's allowed people to anonymous, anonymously report sexual abuse, discrimination, and harassment in academic settings, and she's gotten over 2,000 responses. Uh, the hashtag is MeTooPhD if you're interested. So I spent the better part of 12 years in academia, and for the most part that meant working right alongside very powerful, intelligent men, mostly white men. And I did so with basically every privilege possible except for being a man. My upbringing, my Ivy League education, my access to financial resources, my white skin, my sexual orientation. So in a way, I'm kind of a perfect case study of one, the scientific variable that is the only thing that differentiates me from the other men in power are, is my feminineness, my femaleness. And so while I can't speak to a lot of different types of discrimination, I can speak to what it felt like to be a woman in that space. And for the most part, I was able to succeed, and I had a lot of allies in that space and a lot of support. But I do, without kind of being too melodramatic, I do want to kind of illustrate a couple different personal stories that might help everyone here understand that when men are in positions of power and authority, it ends up affecting women in all sorts of different ways. And some of those ways are very subtle and they happen on a daily basis. <clears throat> so right after I started my postdoc at a major medical institution, you know, some of this stuff, I'm not actually naming names and I'll be very careful, but my bio is public. It's a small world. The psychedelic research community is very small. So I would encourage you to focus on the content and not the characters involved and not try to figure out who I'm talking about. Um, because that's not my intention, it's more to illustrate kind of the reality of what my life was like there. So, so shortly after I started my postdoc, 
my sister was diagnosed with uh, life-threatening breast cancer, stage three. And she was about to undergo radical surgery, removing both her breasts and radiation that was supposed to save her life. And so I was talking to my mentor about getting genetic testing because the form of breast cancer that she had was due to a mutation in her genes. And I had a 50-50 chance of having the same genetic mutation. And he said, well, what are you going to do if you find out you have this genetic mutation? And I said, well, I don't know. I guess I would change the whole course of my life. It would, cha it would change my plans to have children. It would change my idea of my own mortality. And he said, well, if you have to have a double mastectomy, at least you can get bigger breasts. I don't think he understood what he was saying, but I think that jokes like that don't match someone talking about a life-threatening situation. When I was invited to be a keynote speaker at a recent conference, uh, my fellow female colleague and I were housed in a remote farmhouse with a bunch of older men. And some of those men were lovely to hang out with. They're, uh, they're kind of worshipped as idols in their field. And most people would be jealous of us for having such kind of intimate, personal time with these people. And yet, what we had to do while we weren't presenting at the conference was deal with joking marriage propositions and sexual propositions, and offers of psychedelic drugs. And while, again, for some people in the audience, that might sound fantastic, you know, it's like, wow, hanging out with your idols and, and getting all sorts of amazing offers. But for me, I just want to be able to do my job and show up and give a great talk and not have to deal with any of that other bullshit. I've also been offered drugs by funders, people who are responsible for my salary and my research. And kind of the list of kind of subtle transgressions and being treated un unequally, maybe even treated better than some of my male counterparts goes on. But what was the most difficult was to see how women who didn't have PhDs, women who didn't have MDs were treated in the research space. One of the top clinicians in the world, one of the best psychedelic therapists in the world, it took her 10 years to get an authorship on a paper, whereas all of her male colleagues were considered core intellectual contributors, contributors to the research. I saw her clinical judgment judged over and over until young male postdocs could be brought into the room to verify that she was actually right. That was probably one of the straws that broke the camel's back for me. I ended up leaving academia after my sister died. It was a big wake up call for me. And although I had to leave my dreams behind, I was very happy to kind of start a new life. One of the hardest things about leaving that space was it felt like I was leaving behind my sisters and people who, wouldn't, who would no longer have someone to every single day go to the powers that be and say, this is not okay. I still wonder how life is for them in that space. And I think we can do better. Ironically, most of the people up here are going to be talking about how they haven't felt safe necessarily in ceremonial spaces. But for me, leaving academia, that was where I was treated as an equal for the first time in a long time. When men leading ceremonies could actually see me as a full human being, not for what I could do for them or the research that I could uh, advance or the particular power plays. I was just treated as a full human being and helped to heal. Uh, in, in my recent work, I have found that working with community organizers and people who are running even wellness retreats treat me better than my academic mentors and colleagues did. So I don't want to spend too much more time talking about academia. I mean, I think we can all agree if anyone has been in that field, medical institutions are abusive to everyone. So the stories kind of go on and on. Tonight, I would ask that as we turn it over to the remaining panelists, that you listen to their stories, you set aside your self-interest and your need to be right. Um, I know there are lots of nuanced arguments about the patriarchy, but today we're kind of starting simple with some of the kind of some of the more egregious things that have happened to people, happened to women, and allowing them to tell the story the way they want. Because some of the people on this panel tried to tell their story before, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't done in a way that made everyone feel good about it. And it was done in a way that people were scared, maybe this will set back the movement. If we start saying all this stuff about these psychedelic researchers and shamans, then the FDA won't take us seriously, or the medical mainstream won't take us seriously, or the public will say, see, it's the same problems anywhere else. But I think tonight is an opportunity for us to all grow up and be adults about this. And if we can't fix it now, and the community and the 
psychedelic research and everything continues as is, this monster will be lurking in the shadows and it will come out at some point. And so I think it's a great opportunity for us to take control and invite the monster out, look it in the eyes and say, what do you have to teach me? What are you doing here? What can I learn from you and what can you learn from me? So, this is a little bit like jumping into the deep end. Um, I think I would love for Lily to speak first if that feels okay for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lily was a, a grad student at the Harvard School for Divinity, and she also had a harrowing adventure in the jungle of the Amazon. And so I think it kind of makes sense to go from my pure kind of academic intro to Lily, who kind of spans both worlds, and then we will see where it goes from there. Hi there. I, sometimes I feel like maybe I am the monster in the closet on this one. <laughs> Um, so my story sort of begins about 10 years ago. I cottoned on to this ayahuasca situation and I found it very interesting and very compelling and, and it, I, I was living in Santa Cruz at the time, so um, it was a thing. And so when I ended up going to Harvard to pursue my master's in divinity, I kind of went for two reasons. I wanted to do uh, chaplaincy and ministerial work with people at the end of life. And I wanted to explore the ethics of this ayahuasca thing. Because I saw an indigenous practice being uh, westernized and commodified. Um, I saw a lot of people who, I, I had questions about how much training they had because of the stories I was hearing. Um, and so I wondered questions about what kind of power and authority um, it really legitimizes somebody to do this kind of work. So it was, a, it was with those questions in mind that I you know, packed my bags and, and went to Cambridge. And um, partway through that, I got involved in an organization that um, was doing nonprofit work in the Amazon with native communities building media centers and um, giving, giving the uh, villagers tools to sort of tell their own story about the destruction of the Amazon and things like that. And so I got a grant from Harvard to work with this organization to go to the Amazon um, and to spend about nine weeks in this village with um, a man that they um, had met through a connection at a UN conference and had been working with for over two years. Um, they had spent weeks in his village, they, they knew him really well. So I got this grant and, um, and packed my bags and I was getting some credit for it, it was a field education thing for Harvard, and off I went. Well, I will say this, um, the two days before I left I called one of the, my colleagues from the organization and I said, hey, like, I just want to make sure because I've, I've heard things about what, you know, stuff in the Amazon and, and shamans sexually abusing women. I just want to know, like, you know, is, is, this, is this guy going to, like, put moves on me or something? And, and my friend had said, no, no, he would never do that. He's married. He has all these children. Um, he's a really fine, upstanding man. He would, he would never do that kind of thing. Of course, um, that was around the time I even learned he was a shaman. I didn't know he was a shaman until like a few weeks before I was going down there. So I went down there to do this other stuff. He was a shaman. But I felt like, I know this. I know a bit about this. I've studied this a bit. I know that this is a risk. I've, I've done some you know, background checking in terms of you know, who is this guy. And I'd seen his resume and had asked the question, is, is, is this safe? Um, all of that quickly became irrelevant. Um, within a few days of my being there, he um, secretly and without telling me, uh, dosed me with Brumancia or Floripondio, which is a scopolamine alkaloid containing plant um, known for dissolving people's wills in a way. Um, and what ensued was 25 days of being kind of a void of a human being. I had no real will. I don't know if the drugging was ongoing. There was, there was that first night that I eventually realized involved the scopolamine, and then the next day when the first rape happened, and then that night when he uh, gave me ayahuasca, and, uh, 
And in the course of my time there, uh, he raped me maybe five, six, seven times. I never said no, which is interesting. When I reported it to the embassy in Ecuador, they said it wasn't rape because I never said no. But if you know anything about scopolamine and what it does, there is no option. Someone tells you to do something and you just do it. I'm an Aries Leo, for God's sake. Like, <laughs> you know, no one tells me what to do. It just doesn't work. Good luck with that one. But that goes out the window really quick. So that's sort of, that's the dark and the heavy part one. Um, part two was I ended up fleeing the Amazon when I found out that he um, was rumored and alleged to be responsible for multiple murders, some of which involving scopolamine and ayahuasca. And that's a whole other story. But what I'm trying to convey to you in a way is the severity of the situation I was in. It was, it was pretty out of this world. It was immensely terrifying. Um, and it, it, it broke me in some ways. So when I found that out, I managed to escape and get away and get back to the US. Um, but to be honest, like so many victims of sexual violence, I could have come back from that. What broke me was the response of my community when I came home. So again, I have, to, I have limited time here, so I have to pick some bits and pieces of it. Um, but I was told um, to shut up. I had opportunities to tell the story on large um, platforms, and I was overwhelmed at the prospect. And so I was seeking counsel from the elders in my community, and I was told that if I spoke out about this, that I would single-handedly be responsible for reinitiating the war on drugs, and um, that I was going to undo decades of um, advocacy for psychedelic research to carry forward. And I was told I should have known better. I should have known better to go to a place like that and not take better precautions. And a statement like that, I, I want to linger on that statement for a moment, because not only is it victim blaming, but it's also racist. What are we saying about indigenous men if we say, hey, white woman, you should have known better? Excuse me? That doesn't really sit right at all. Um, and it still doesn't sit right. And it's still something that people will say occasionally. So I, I had a big falling out with um, the psychedelic community. The, the term now is, is secondary victimization. So after a long time passed and my heart had been thoroughly broken and I, I had a moment where I realized I don't get back the life I had before this. I don't get to be the person I was before this. I'm going to do something new. And um, I had the opportunity to, to move overseas and to, to pursue a, a PhD in sexual violence and victim blame. So my ship turned quite a bit. Um, and I learned things like secondary victimization, which is um, the period after sexual violence. I learned things like adjacent victimization, which is the way in which people who love victims and survivors um, might be impacted by the suffering that they see happening to you know within their loved one. Um, and I learned about this thing called reactive victim scapegoating. So I'll, I'll drop a little bit of this, and then I'll go ahead and pass it on. Um, so Van, uh, Jan van Dijk is a, um, a scholar based in the Netherlands, and he has done some really interesting research into the etymology and history of the word victim. So victim derives from uh, the, Lat the Latin word victima, which is an animal offered in sacrifice. And it was not applied to human beings until Johannes Calvin in the 16th century applied it to Christ as the expiatory victim, the victim by way um, of sacrifice redeems mankind for their sins. And you can see that he traces this kind of 100-year period where you start to see biblical texts referring to Christ as victim. And it wasn't until several hundred years later that it started to expand out into um, more, you know, victims of crime, victims of natural disasters, things like that. Um, but what came along with that history is an expectation that victims bear their victimization with a certain passivity, a certain meekness, a turning of the other cheek, so to speak, and a, and a Christ-like, inhuman ability to forgive their abusers and move on. Thank you very much. So that's one side of the spectrum. But we also live in a cultural 
context in which we are constantly told to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, to be strong, to overcome adversity. A great book by Barbara Ehrenreich called Smile or Die. She talks about how um, women who are cancer patients are expected within the discourses of, of the kind of cancer community to um, turn their cancer into the best thing that ever happened to them. And it woke them up and transformed their life. But this is the logic that we're living in. And that logic is very much at odds with the meekness and the passivity. But what Van Dyke argues is that, and he uses a lot of examples of public victims to, to exemplify this, and he analyzes this. He says, when victims don't behave in the way that we expect, when they're not forgiving, when they're not passive, when they're not meek, they are vilified. The media and the public, they turn against them. And the problem is not the abuser who has harmed all of us. The problem is the victim for carrying themselves in a certain way, for daring to speak about the thing that happened. And so I learned this is the thing that happened to me, this reactive victim scapegoating. At the same time, I had people telling me beautiful jewels like, oh, you should totally tell your story, just make sure it's inspiring and uplifting because no one wants a downer. I really loved that one. It really touched my heart, you know, because it's just like, yeah, let me put a positive spin on this one. How about I'm alive? For a period of time, that was kind of all I had. I'm alive. It's gotten a lot better, and it does get better. Um, and I, I tell this story today because I have a lot of hope that we can do better um, by believing people when they come forward, by believing that the safety of members of our community um, and, and inclusivity of members of our community is more important than the optics of our community. Um, yeah, I, I've experienced some exceptional kindness from people over the years in addition to some some harrowing and awful betrayals and injuries. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, I'm still sort of shunned in the psychedelic community, or a controversial figure, as it were. And I'm okay with that. Because what else is there to do but just keep speaking? Which is, I guess, what we're doing here tonight. So. Hopefully the next story won't be so heavy. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Sita, Oriana, anyone? Can you guys hear us? Maybe. Hey there. I'm going to speak up if that's okay. Yep, it's great. And I'm going to time it so we can keep it on seven minutes for everybody else. Um, so my name is Oriana. Um, I am a community organizer here in upstate New York. Um, I have been involved with the Sunnydale community for um, since I was 19, so about seven years now. And um, one of the things that I mentioned to Catherine, and one of the reasons I'm really excited to be on this panel is I think that often um, we're talking about privilege. Um, and male supremacy, we have to really talk about white supremacy. It's really important. I'm happy to see that there are people of color in this room. Um, it makes me really happy to see that, but we know that the psychedelic world um, is predominantly white and how problematic that is. Um, and so one of the things that I'm working on up here in New York is um, dismantling racism and um, burning down capitalism as we know it. And I'm finding that um, as, a, as a woman of color, um, it's extremely challenging to come out about the sexual harassment that I've experienced in the psychedelic community um, because I've not afforded the same privileges as my peers on this panel. So in other words, if I were to say, so-and-so touched me this way on a car ride five years ago, um, when I talk about and I think about um, the, the consequences that that would bring upon me, um, they're really frightening. I, I really feel deeply that even now, even with the support of the incredible people that I've known, my mentors, um, even in this moment, I don't feel safe out in the person 
who harassed me because I, I really fear that I would be blocked from being able to do research or attend conferences and as a speaker or as a moderator, or as a facilitator. Um, and that's really real. And um, I, I too um, am a survivor of sexual assault and I'm related to the psychedelic community. Um, and like really mentioned before, you know, secondary victimization is something that I unfortunately experienced too. It was really painful for me. Um, but when I think about the psychedelic community, um, especially in New York City, we have the potential, I think, to really start this conversation. I'm so happy that Catherine um, and Dimitri invited me to be a part of this talk because I think that often um, we need to sort of like analyze and examine our privileges. Um, and I would like it so that the future of these, convers these conversations will, will have more, um, will be a little more diverse, right? And um, I don't know, I just came back from Mexico with Catherine. It was a, we just went on a, to um, a conference about psychedelic community and cryptocurrency. And it was really interesting to be in a room full of people with a tremendous amount of power and, you know, thinking about our future as a community, you know, when we're thinking about funding for these types of panels, um, you know, we need to be very intentional. I think about who we're collaborating with and who we're inviting to these spaces and um, who's supporting this work. That makes it, I think, um, yeah, I think it's important to keep, you know, some sort of accountability with that. These are just like thoughts that I've been thinking, but um, what I wanted to really bring to the table was that before Catherine and I met on Sunday on our plane right back to New York, um, this panel um, was predominantly white women. And I, I really felt that, um, you know, it's sort of, that, that is a psychological community, right? And so one of the things that I hope to do is to um, continuously advocate for people of color in this work um, and make sure that they also have, that their voices are lifted and that they feel safe and able to speak. Um, and also to recognize that, you know, um, we, we, we have a, little, a lot more to lose when coming out, out about sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing I'll leave you with is sort of my journey to this community when I was 19, I um, had spent a year doing some healing work, um, therapy, psychotherapy, talk therapy, and like dance classes, um, EMDR, um, to you know to work through the trauma from my sexual assault. And um, I discovered MDMA, and it changed my life. And um, I, I love it. Um, and um, decided that I wanted to forever advocate for that medicine. Um, in our community, and um, in that process, um, realized that we're a really privileged community to be able to talk about these things in the first place, um, and that I really wanted to focus my work on um, slightly different stuff. But now that I'm sort of back here and, and sort of getting myself involved again with the work that we're doing, um, my goal in life is to make sure that people of color have access to this medicine so they can work through the trauma of sexual assault, so they can work through the trauma of sexual violence, so that they can work through the trauma of experiencing sexual harassment um, at large. And so that is what I'm doing, and that's who I am, and I um, hope that's helpful to anyone in the room. Thank you so much, Oriana, and actually, she, um, I'm so glad that she also contextualized how she ended up on the panel because that's a great example of me being completely wrong and her bringing that to my attention and, and me doing the best I could to try to fix it even if it was just something small. And so uh, in my Zen practice, I've learned that it's a lot easier to be wrong than to be right <laughs> because when you're wrong, you learn something. And so, um, Oriana, thank you so much for having the courage to call me out and to point out that I wasn't seeing through my privilege of inviting mostly my white friends to be on a panel with me. And I'm so happy that it worked out and even better next time to get you here in person, give you a little <laughs> bit more heads up. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you guys. Yeah, something um, that we were talking about earlier at dinner was that psychedelics can be used for so many things and it seems like we're only using them for a couple things, one of which is putting them into mainstream medicine, which itself is a place of trauma and abuse for lots of people and unequal treatment and we're using them for ego trips so it's like we picked the like two most dumb applications for psychedelics and we're like all in like let's go for the ego trip and the mainstream medicine <laughs> and so it's just like a challenge to be a little bit more creative 
Like psychedelics don't make you a better person. They don't make you automatically atone and forgive and, and learn how to see all of your faults, but they can. And so let's actually have the medicines work for us and we can work for them too. And there's a relationship there. So I thank you for tying in the most obvious point that this isn't just any community this is happening in. This is happening in the community where allegedly we're all supposed to be getting enlightened, right? Evolving consciousness. Yeah, Hashtag. evolving consciousness. <laughs> Hashtag evolving consciousness. Um, Can I make one comment yep. on that? Yeah, I, I want to comment quickly that like, Predators will use whatever tools are available to them to do what they're going to do, and the responsibility lies 100% with them for doing so, and so they'll leverage whatever they got, and if what they've got is psychedelic drugs, then, then that's what they're going to do, and I think it's also worth naming that the injury that is sustained when somebody is raped and abused in that kind of a state of consciousness is a different kind of injury than when somebody is, I'm not saying it's worse, I'm just saying that it is a different kind of injury. Um, the, the two aren't, aren't quite the same. So, yeah, um, I think that's important to kind of keep in mind and to remember that, you know, predators seem to, I'm stepping a little bit outside some of my expertise here when I sort of say that experts have a, experts, um, predators have a, an uncanny ability to pick their targets. And that's not the responsibility of their targets. Um, that's the responsibility of, of the predators, and if and if one of their targets is successful in fending them off, they will find another one. That's that's kind of all there is to it. So the more we look at victims and blame victims and say, well, they should have known better and everything else, those are hours lost when communities could be rallying together to oust people who have shown us who they are, um, and um, potentially work to correct the behavior or potentially just tell them to. Go to prison? I don't know. I'm sort of a prison abolitionist, so I can't really say that. <laughs> um, so I, I think I want, Dimitri, could, if you could go next, and then I want to end I thought the you just let the old white guy go last. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this old white guy. Let <laughs> me go next. Well, because I want to end the panel portion with Sita. Okay, cool. Um, before we open it up to the audience. So here you go. Oh, um... I really want to say how grateful I am. Um, I'm incredibly grateful and incredibly moved to be on this panel with you all. I'm just, the word bravery gets tossed around, but I feel your bravery, all of you. I'm really moved. And, and angry. Uh, I was listening, because I was told to listen to fucking Eckhart Tolle on the way here on, this, on, <laughs> on the bus, and he always drives me crazy. <laughs> And he was talking about anger, you know, and I had to look at it. I was going, shut the fuck up with your anger and shit. And anyway, so I'm glad for anger. I'm grateful for anger right now. Um, maybe some of y'all can help me meditate at some point. Uh, <laughs> and then I was thinking, what story do I have? Like, what's my story? And I think, well, I didn't have a narrative. But my, I do have a narrative that's, that's part of this. And it might explain why I sort of pushed to have this panel. Um, you know, I, 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 for those of you who don't know my story, I was a, a IV drug user for many, many years. Um, and I eventually found Iboga and healing, and then I did uh, many uh, ceremonies with people in the United States underground. Um, I haven't used in over 16 years. Um, and there was, there was a lot of root to my cause, the cause of my use. And one of them, was that I was sexually abused. And I don't talk very much about it or very much in detail about it because there's a shame and a stigma for anybody, for men, for men of certain ethnic groups to talk about it, but I was abused. I didn't even, wasn't even able to name it because I was 13 and 14 and <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of all this, I thought that I had, I had agency. Mm -hmm. um, through this medicine, I realized that I didn't have agency, that, that I was abused, and that it continues to inform my life. Uh, how many years later? 40-something years. And when I hear that so many of the people come to us for this type of healing, and when I hear that that is crossed over, when I hear a drug addict, is raped in a fucking clinic, 
my anger um, is also very personal. Um, and I know it's not about me, uh, but I get mad. Um, what I'd like to see, I'd like to see these medicines work in destroying, dismantling, naming, naming this killing that's happening amongst us all. Naming the patriarchy, we need to name it. Naming the racism, naming the homophobia and transphobia, naming capitalism, naming the economic structure that contributes to all of this, that builds all of this. Now, this shit's gonna happen anyway, because we're human, but we're in a structure that promotes and feeds on this. It feeds on hierarchy. So how do we have space? How do we make space that we, no one can hold? I'm done with holding space. That's a capitalist construct, holding space. Fuck holding space. You can't hold space, can you? It's a beautiful thing about space. You can't hold it. Space is the place. Yeah, I'm I got the space. It now. You got it now. I'll be back at six. Fuck question. So this is what interests me. What scares me about the so-called consciousness community is the lack of consciousness. <laughs> the lack of an analysis and a deep willingness to go inside to look. I've been initiated in the Bwiti. I've been back to Gabon many times. It is one of the things in my life that I treasure the most, that experience, those connections. But what happened over years is I saw a high article system as well, that perhaps through the, you know, this magic that happens, and I think it is magic, this transformation and transmutation that happens in the Middle Passage and going back and forth in both of these continents, that part of what we can do is contribute to a dismantling of that hierarchy and using techniques and structures and, and, and music and sharing music and sharing techniques and structures to dismantle this and, and deliver these medicines in a horizontal, non-hierarchical structure. And I think there are, in the world, I think there's, there's examples of ways to do that. I don't think this is impossible. I think it's possible. But I think the biggest problem that we have in the psychedelic community is thinking that these things, I'm not gonna call them medicines for the rest of the panel. These drugs, <laughs> and I love drugs. I don't say drugs are bad, I love drugs. These drugs, are not the answer. Mm. These drugs, when administered and given within the context of a hierarchical capitalist system, is actually the problem. The only consistent thing that I've seen with psychedelics is it makes sociopaths better sociopaths. And I've seen it over and over again. It gives them a platform, gives them a job to do. <laughs> so, and you know, there was a study out of Canada where they tried to give LSD to all these sociopaths and they came out like able to mimic yeah, fucking emotion. So I was like, shit, it, you, know, you know, I'm not a big fan of research, but like when it, when it fucking suits my case, I'm down, right? So like, so um, I think that when we look at these things as commodities, they will, they will be given as commodities and the results will be a commodified result. We need to take it out of the capitalist system. Look, it's the end, man. This is it. We come out of these fucking experiences. We have this oceanic fucking expansion, this and... And they're like, well, how can we get this to Pfizer? Like, let's get the work right the fuck away. That shows, that shows the power of, of, of capitalism, the power of the corporate state, the power of, of the, the medical and industrial complex. And that's what we're up against. To simply inject it, we will, it will be disastrous results. Let's go see to... Sita, I would love to hear from you, and then we'll open it up to some more discussion, and also I want the audience to be able to have their say if they would like to. Great, thank you. And thank you all. Um, there's a little bit of feedback. Okay, I think maybe, okay, not now. So um, good evening, everyone, and um, hello to everybody, and thank you for all of the, the stories and statements that you've made thus far. Um, and um, yeah, there's so much. I'm sitting here with my head in a bit of a spin figuring out, okay, so how do I um, 
say, you know, pick and choose the, the most important things. So I think, first off, I just want to uh, point out a few things that struck me as everybody else was speaking. Oriana, you mentioned that you just come from Tulum with Catherine. And um, about, you know, this, I actually heard about it very late in the game, but there's there's this psychedelic cryptocurrency conference with a lot of, I think you used the word, powerful people. And I just am throwing this out there for what it's worth. And, you know, here we are in a really like more cottage industry, it, it, um, intimate kind of setting um, at the Alchemist Kitchen. And there was, um, you know, some promotion, not a lot, but some promotion to raise like $1,000 for this topic to help pay for airfare. And $220 was raised. And I kind of get this feeling that if it was about something else having to do with research with a bunch of white men, it would be a hell of a lot more than $220, just saying. So I um, wanted to point that out. Thank you very much um, for uh, providing the psychedelic cryptocurrency contrast. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I wanted to, to mention um, is that I'm not much of a smasher. I may have been in my youth but not so much anymore, but I am a dismantler. And I think that it's important to dismantle things because I like to look at the pieces as they're coming apart to make sure I don't use those same pieces to put back something in place that wasn't working previously. Um, and to say that I am not an ac academic by any stretch of the imagination. And I think I'm gonna share a little bit about what um, my own personal background that I don't normally share in my bios. So I am 58 years old. I'm 33 years sober in the conventional sense. I was born and raised inner city poor in Philadelphia. Um, you know, a far, far like world away from, you know, the jungles of Peru um, and really Brazil, where I started my journey uh, with ayahuasca. So just a, and and in an era where talking about a hierarchy or a patriarchy like just wasn't happening. Okay, you know, like when I was a, a teenager and in my early twenties, it was like the nineteen seventies and early eighties. So it's a very different era, and so I'm really grateful to be in this era now where we are having these conversations. Um, so you know, a couple of snippets I'll share. One is my first trip to the Amazon was to the Brazilian Amazon. And it was a retreat uh, that was um, hosted and it, there was a faculty. And um, with the exception of one person, um, no surprise, this was in 2001, they were all white men. And promptly after my very first ayahuasca ceremony, I was propositioned by one of them. So, you know, and my guard was up, but I was still like so new to the whole scene and the world. And then I found out, oh, you know, this guy's a researcher and he's published and, you know, and I didn't have that kind of background. So I felt particularly um, like I wasn't um, flattered, but very confused. And as time went on, what I started to notice even then, like this is, you know, 2000, 2001, and continuing until 2008 is, well, isn't this interesting? Every conference we go to, like, it seems to be a bunch of, like, middle-aged white guys. And that's certainly, to me, what conventional power structure culture in the United States looks like. And so um, in Ibiza, at the um, World I Ayahuasca uh, Conference um, a few years ago, um, I think it was in 2013, um, I looked and I'm like, wow, like there's so few women, there's so few actual healers and so few people of color. And so I set out to create a conference, um, which I did in 2008 and Dimitri was there. And I have to tell you how hard it was for me. Now, now granted, you know, I'm living in my isolated, insulated world, but to find people of color as presenters, I did, I did actually hit the 50% mark with 50% of the presenters being women and with the keynote, the plenary address being from a woman. But like this was like in 2015. So it's pretty crazy that, you know, I think that the psychedelic community and the plant medicine community is actually still pretty much mirroring, you know, the white power structure. So just to reaffirm what everybody was talking about earlier about academia, it's, it, it's kind of true across the board. Um, 
And in these last few minutes that I have, I want to talk about this guruization of indigenous healers um, that uh, Britta touched on. So in um, 2000, I, 2002, I started traveling to the Peruvian Amazon and ultimately was um, continually called to the, to the work with, with ayahuasca and master plant dietas. And then I was um, invited to apprentice with the Shipibo maestro Guillermo Arevalo, also known as Kesten Betza. And he was my maestro. And, you know, I continued to diet with him over a period of years. And at one point it came to my intention that he had been sexually abusing a woman. And the minute that happened, um, the story was based on something that, that had happened a few years prior. And I was getting ready to do a big retreat at his healing center. Um, and, I, and I flew down there because I thought, like, I don't care how close we are. Like, this is not happening if this is true. And um, I flew down there. And he, in fact, acknowledged to me, yes, it was true, that, that everything that was reported was accurate, had happened, and that he and his family, who I knew had a big meeting and we all sat together, yes, I'm healing. I've actually, I don't even like put a hand on someone else's hand in a ceremony. And, and I should say, like, I don't want to say sexually abusing, sexually assaulting, raping, you know, in ceremony, out of ceremony. And, and I thought, okay. And, and actually, it was so interesting because I was bamboozled. Because it turns out that's his MO. He admits it and says, I'm working on it. And then you think, oh, and of course the story is already dated from two years prior. And that's why I'm not having that experience or I'm not hearing about it. So, um, but it turns out upon further investigation, that was his MO for the previous 15 years. And every person, and then, you know, around that time in 2008, I started asking people and everybody knew. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And at that time, I'm like, I can't work with this person. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I wound up, as an aside, just going directly to the plants, which was great for my learning. But I was just really shocked. And everybody knew. And nobody did anything. So I will say I stopped recommending people and I started talking about it. And I'm just offering that as a backdrop because two months ago I got a call from somebody who, Guillermo, have been doing their medicine circles and she's like, turns out the story came out we've been sexually abusing at least one of our community members and nobody checked him out. And when they did, they found all these stories on the internet and there have been letters that have been signed. And I just thought to myself, this is like just, I'm not drawing a conclusion here, but I'm saying, okay, here we are. It's 2018. And it's just like, a, a big job to look at all the structures and all the ways in which we collectively support somebody who at this point is an international criminal who goes around the world raping women. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's infuriating and it, um, like I, I can't even wrap my head around how this thing can still be going on. So, um, for me, I'm happy to, you know, in this particular instance, because it's such a glaring example, um, you know, talk about the email and also to, you know, I guess say to people, like, maintain your critical faculty and, and, and please, like, do your homework and, you know, don't mistake the practitioner for the medicine or the practitioner for the plant, right? And, I think that's part of it. We become enchanted and then um, victimized, to use a word that's been used earlier. Thank you. Can I just say one more thing, Catherine? Yes, absolutely. Um, just, just, just the one thing I just realized, like, um, when we're thinking about the relationship, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. When we're thinking about the relationship, about, you know, all this violence that's happening, the, all these examples, violence towards women, when I think about who would give me the most strength to come out and say, this is the person that touched me inappropriately five years ago and really out this person. If the infrastructure was set up so that women were leading this in this world, that there were more women on boards, there were more women leading research, 
I would feel like I don't have to worry about losing a job, right? Because my ladies are going to back me up and they're going to hire me. I don't give a shit. But because right now, in the next 10 to 20 years, it's still going to be mostly male-dominated, I don't feel safe, right? Because we're just thinking about that relationship, you know, what I was saying before. It's like the instance of, of, of you know, violence, it, it's, it goes from the beginning, you know, from the research boards being just full of men. It's like the whole spectrum mm-hmm. of a problem. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that point. I mean, I, I was kind of looking at, I don't know what you call this, it's not a glass ceiling, but when you realize that the top man in the top position isn't going to retire, and then the person, the man up below him is never going to retire, and so then you kind of look at your whole entire life in this state of limbo, some days are great, some days are hell, and you'll just be kind of like giving up your whole life for something that you believe in, always answering to these men in charge, Um, that structure and system makes expert women leave. I left for a lot of reasons, but one of the primary reasons was that that there was nowhere to go. And even if I got to the top, I'd still be answering to billionaire men in charge of funding and funding their ideas, not mine. And so thank you for pointing that out. You know, as when I left, my cousin, who was one of the first women as a partner in one of the big, you know, international accounting firms in the world, she said, why don't you just start your own research center and only hire women? And maybe I still will, but I, you know, being out of academia is nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I still think that that's on the horizon. And I think you bring up an important point that until we create, maybe it's a stepping stone, right? We're dismantling, but in the meantime, it would be nice for women like you, Oriana, and women like Lily to have a place where they could be hired exactly as they are and not have it be about the female at the top just reiterating all the same problems as the men at the top. And so, you know, I had to kind of take a step back and work on myself to figure out how we might even create spaces like that. And I'm still learning, but um, that's a really, really good point. And so um, we have a hard stop at 10 p.m. So that gives us 45 minutes, which is a lot, but maybe not a lot if there are people who really want to share. And so what I was thinking is one thing we could do, I mean, as you can imagine, everyone up here has a million opinions, we're all really smart, we're creative, we have a lot to say, (laughs) but uh, there are people in the audience who never get to speak, Um, they never get to be on panels, they're not even, you know, known in the scene. And so I would love to give any of you an opportunity to talk, and it doesn't have to be eloquent, it doesn't have to be thought out, it just, you know, just speak from your own experience, and... um, and we'll not hold space for that. <laughs> um, each person, will, we're going to give you three minutes and really try to hold you to that so that other people have a chance. And I don't know if anyone wants to kind of be the most courageous person to try this out. Um, we're all kind of making it up as we go. And uh, I am going to give priority to women first. Sorry. <laughs> Are we taking questions? Well, I want to kind of, I want to see if there are any people who want to share first, and then um, questions are also totally awesome. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to pass that back. And if you, you can share as is, and then if afterward, please let me know if you want your story included in the film or not. We can make it work either way. I um, was assaulted by a babysitter when I was four years old and dealt my entire life with that, mostly because um, I was told not to talk about it. And over the course of my life, I did therapy, I got involved with an herbalism class and worked with plants that helped me, um, allowed me to, to have a voice about what had happened. And eventually, um, I heard about ayahuasca and de- decided to try that as a way to um, sort of resolve these issues that have been plaguing me. Mostly about trust and um, my ability to, I guess what I had learned as a child was that what I thought was something that had gone wrong and then had been told that I needed to forget about it, I learned not to trust my gut. So I had problems in relationships and wanted to finally put that all to to bed. Um, In the course of ceremony, it wasn't the um, healer, but it was somebody 
sitting beside me that assaulted me um, repeatedly over the course of the night. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't, uh, you know, didn't beat me, but he kept grabbing me between my legs. And I was under the influence and like, kept like stop it. And I was more annoyed than anything. Um, and then in the morning when we were all sort of awake and lying there trying to process what had happened, he did it again and I got pissed. And I got up out of off my mat and went and talked to the one of the healers there, one of the guides, and had a conversation eventually with this guy, young guy. And he said, I feel really uncomfortable and started to cry and the um, the guide said, well, I believe you. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what just happened here? Um, mm -hmm. I told you what my experience was, and he didn't say he didn't do it, but suddenly it became about the plant giving me this opportunity to deal with this trauma. Oh, my God. And I bought it. And I was like, OK. This is my opportunity to deal with this young man who reminded me in a lot of ways of this babysitter who had assaulted me. And I, um, you know, I called him out and, and then I forgave him. And for me, it was a really powerful moment. And I insisted that I was the one that got to speak to him. But then I went home and I spoke to a friend of mine and she's like, Donna, do you understand what happened? I mean, I didn't even see it. The, the fault, or the fault was put on the plant and not on this young man. Mm -hmm. And he was never called out for what he did. So I called back this, this guide and relayed this story. And it was still, it was still sort of, oh, this was, you know, this was your opportunity. It all ended on a high note. This was a great thing. Um, and it wasn't until the end of the conversation where I said, look, this was an opportunity for him too. Who assaults women? Women that have, people that have been assaulted. And you completely left him out of the equation. And that is wrong on your fault, and that is, that is wrong on your side, and it's wrong for anybody else that attends that ceremony with this young man in attendance. And what they did was end up dividing the space by sex so that the women were in one room and the men were in another room. And he hasn't come back yet, but um, from what I, it, it seemed to me like a solution. Anyways, that was just something I wanted to. Thank share. you so Thank much. That's sort of an example of like a Wait, second. In the mic. Like, just. This is an example, sort of an extreme example of psychedelic gaslighting, mm -hmm. which happens all the time. Um, and so much power given over to an inanimate object, regardless. I mean, look, I talk to a boba every day, but I understand it's a plant, and whatever I do, I'm doing. Um, so I think it's rampant in the community, it's sort of rampant in spiritual spaces where we have to have a positive outcome of everything. And it's also part of the deeper psychedelic narrative that there is a healing that is linear, that it ends, you sort it out, and you move on. I think there's a sort of a, it kind of runs in a parallel for cognitive behavioral therapy, you know? Like, we're gonna just get this done in 12 sessions and then you're out the door. Um, so thank you so much for sharing it. I, I just wanna sort of piggyback on that. I think when, we, when we're afraid to call folks out for the movement, we have to ask what the movement is. Mm. What what movement are we are we afraid is going to get derailed that involves coercion and rape? So if that's the movement, then I want no part of it. That's exactly what I said when I left. I think I used those exact words. This this is not this is not something I can be a part of for those reasons. Yeah, thank you for sharing your story and um, to, just to echo some of what you experienced, I, I also had people telling me that my rapist had done it to heal me and that I should thank him. Yeah, so um, that's, that's pretty common. Sure. Uh, 
Um, I feel a little nervous asking this question because I don't need to be anyway, but I feel like a lot of, I just could use a little clarity maybe on the association with what Catherine started out with naming, you know, the proportionality of white males on the boards of MAPS and Hefner and these organizations and these experiences, these very uh, glaring experiences of sexual assault. Because the, the title of the panel has been Psychedelics and the Patriarchy, whereas a lot of the tone of what the content of this has been tonight has been psychedelics and women's experiences of sexual assault, which is a very serious topic. But I guess I'm just confused about where the association between like the umbrella of the patriarchy uh, combines with that. Um, chew on that, I guess. You want to answer it? Yeah. I can. Can we pass the mic? <laughs> This is not a thorough answer. <laughs> um, one of the issues that surrounds patriarchy is not just control over people's bodies, people's minds, how they're supposed to respond, what's going to be an acceptable adventure in this arena. They also control and prioritize what is an acceptable feeling and in the, especially in the consciousness community. And it's been in the religious communities as well as bearers of moral import. Um, love is put at the top. That's the high, that's the high vibration. At the bottom is the low vibration. That's anger or something like that. And then you have variances in between. What they have done is to take a whole spectrum of feelings and they have said that some are good and some are bad. They have turned them into moral qualities rather than just feelings. So what happens is that when people who are not acceptable as equal to the patriarchy, and I'm talking about women, when they have feelings, they are put on a lower spectrum as to what is acceptable for a woman to express. It's the same thing for men who, those like myself, who have been sexually molested as children and raped, uh, when uh, we want to say these things, we are told, oh, well, that's in the past. Mm -hmm. That's a patriarchal attitude, which wants to control how people can relate within the culture. And, and that is directly a patriarchal attitude. So, when we're talking, whether we're talking about um, the research world, or we're talking about what happens to women, or I have to say also in my case, what happens to men within ceremony. Um, we're really talking about how this devolves through the entire structure of society and not just ours. This is a worldwide problem. And we're just beginning to talk about this. And one of the places I want to look at why I say it this way is to look at the structure of our feelings. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable? because that's the place where hierarchy is telling you how to be as a human being. Um, just to kind of add on that, um, patriarchy isn't just about sexual assault, although that is a huge major aspect. It's also about communication and how people talk to you. Um, working in the IBGAN community, I can't tell you how many people tell you what you need to do and how the right way to do things is. Um, saying that there's a black and white way to do things or right and wrong or absolutes or that you have an authority over other people, that is patriarchy, that is hierarchy. Um, and it mostly does come from men, but I also see it coming from women. Um, I recently did an ayahuasca ceremony here in Manhattan. And at the end of the ceremony, when I wanted to leave early and they weren't, I wasn't allowed to do that, I was told that if I left, I would be doing things wrong and I was gonna have left something unhealed. So this man was telling me that I was doing my healing wrong if I didn't play by his rules. That is patriarchy. When somebody in the IBM community tells a person reaching out for treatment that they need to do this or they need to do that, that is patriarchy. And I think that that is a, it's much less violent than sexual assault, but it's something that needs to be recognized. And recently this was really brought to my attention in an exchange I had in one of these um, Facebook IBM groups, which I try to stay away from. Um, but. It was a man telling a woman that she was doing something wrong and she needs to do this. And this is a man running a clinic. 
and I called him out and he told me that I just wanted to argue with him and that's why I was bringing it up. Um, so I think that it's important to recognize that communication and, and telling people what to do, that is also patriarchy and that is also hierarchy and authoritarianism. But the subtitle of the, uh, we didn't get put, uh, what, was the, what was the rest of the title for, it was um, psycho, uh, male, male supremacy psych, and psychedelic patriarchy, uh, oppression, oppression, repression, repression and, and abuse in ritual and research. And I think there is a connection. And I think, you know, someone else can illustrate it better than I can, but. And next time we're going to add white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, male domination and white male domination, these take many different forms. So in the workspace, which has become quite the, the talked about thing at the moment, and it manifests in sexual violence and other spaces. But I also want to like kind of lift up something that you had said about sort of resisting male domination and being told you're being argumentative. Because one of the things I was observing just in the dynamics of our panel is that all of the women, when we've been speaking, are keeping quite an even tone. We're rational, we're together, and God bless you. <laughs> he did, and he channeled a lot, you know, he brought in a lot of anger. I have to say, I am outraged. I have lost sleep for, for, for my rage in the last few weeks. Um, and I, ch I channel it in the ways that I can, um, but in part, I try to tone it down because an outraged woman doesn't have the same credibility. How huh. dare I have my feelings about this? I have to be, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to be even keeled and level-headed and deliver it in just the right way so that people's heckles don't go up. I don't have the luxury to express my outrage. So instead, it keeps me awake at night. <coughs> you know, so yeah, just right here in the in the New York City community, um, I have been told that my anger is me operating at a lower vibration, and that if I really did my own work, that I would learn how to not be so angry. <laughs> and believe me, I mean, it could be a lot worse. I have done my own work around anger, but it's amazing, right? It's like, and you, I'm not getting that from women. It's all the men basically telling me how I should be in order to get things done. That's your narrative, it's your personality. You're not being diplomatic enough, you're being too angry. And at some point, you it is like gaslighting, right? You think that there's something wrong with you and that if you just are nice enough about it or um, political enough or cooperative enough or um, submissive enough that you will you know, get the things that you want. And very recently, someone helped me understand that I prioritize trust and safety but I'm willing to actually put myself in unsafe situations to be trustworthy and to be respected rather than prioritize my own safety and you know, potentially let someone down. And that usually that involves me having to align myself with powerful men who I don't feel safe around. Mm -hmm. And that, that has continued ever since I left Hopkins. And so, um, yeah, I mean, these are things that like, you know, someone said uh, a bunch of women were all talking about these issues at the Crypto Psychedelic Conference. And this guy walked up and he's like, oh man, you guys are just in it. And I think someone's like, yeah, we're always in it. <laughs> this isn't just like a conversation choice. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what, this is our life. I wanted to add also that um, I think so often when we start talking about sexual assault, we sort of put this in this other box, like we're talking about sex, but we're actually talking about power. Mm -hmm. And patriarchy is a system of power. And so, we can kind of point to the most egregious episodes of the exploitation and abuse of power mm -hmm. through sexual assault, but we're actually still just talking about a continuation of the microaggressions that Catherine was subjected to at Hopkins. There's a, just a, a kind of, um, and also that um, our response is often to sort of go down this very binary road. And I'd, I'd love to think that just by putting more women into these systems of power, which should happen 100%, that we would be solving the problems. But I think that's a really biologically deterministic idea. And I think that um, not only are there more genders than just men and women, and we've been having a really binary conversation. Yes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I want to put that up. And we also have had a quite a heteronormative conversation because sexual assault is huge in the queer communities. And had many men, too. We've had two men talk about experiencing sexual abuse. So it's really hard because, you know, there, there are these dominant narratives that when we're finally having a chance to talk about 
um, you know, this kind of exploitation in the, in the psychedelic community, we default to sort of marginalizing still the other most more marginalized. We leave out talking about women of color. We talk, we don't talk about the intersectionality of like, you know, queer race, you know. So all those things, but I just, I guess my biggest point was just looking at how these systems of power replicate themselves and thinking about how we consciously create new structures um, where regardless of who's involved and what the demographic mix are, that we're not replicating the same hierarchy, like Gi Juliana was talking about, the systems of hierarchy, and we stop holding space for each other. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes. Thank you, Britta, for introducing, helping me to find my bravery as I was sitting here thinking about um, sharing. Um, so some of you guys know me. Um, I uh, am a psychotherapist and I deal a lot with psychedelic integration and I have had the privilege to speak on panels in, in front of people. And when I do, one of the thir first things that I say is that I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and of sexual assault. And psychedelics were a huge part of like the pivotal part in my healing from that. And thankfully, I have not been, um, I have not experienced sexual assault in a ceremony context. But what I did want to share today is the experience of queer women in this community. I'm a queer woman. And um, as everyone was speaking, a situation came to mind where uh, I had done ceremonies with someone who I was told was a very trustworthy practitioner. I get an email saying um, we're no longer, this person is no longer considered trustworthy. If you have questions about this, contact so-and-so, who is a higher up person in this organization. And I understand I'm being a little bit vague about what I mean in all of this, just to protect people's identities. Um, so I had really just worked with this person, and when I called to ask like what was going on, uh, the more senior person said without missing a beat, oh, it was a sexual misconduct thing don't even worry about it. He would never fuck with you. And what he meant was basically like, you're not a thin, straight, pretty woman. We basically consider you one of the guys. Nobody is going to fuck with you in a ceremonial context. And it really made me think when I was sexually assaulted in college, the first person I disclosed to said, I, I don't think anyone could rape you. And completely erasing my experience. Um, so I think because queer people do experience sexual violence and at, at such higher rates, trans people exponentially higher, um, we do a really, really poor job at um, supporting queer people and women of color in our community and have basically erased the, um, the uh, experiences that you know, we're facing all the time. So I think this is a much bigger topic, but I just wanted to, well, there was an avenue mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. open it up. I just wanted mm -hmm. to share a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just jump in and say thank you so much for sharing that, because I think it's really important um, to know that, you know, like we're also talking, you know, and I know I have been about men and women and a now practitioner and, you know, women participants. But, it's across the board, you know, this, um, I, I, and what I, I want to also throw into the mix is an acute awareness that I have of women angling for positions and then like buying in, feeding in to the hierarchy of the patriarchy, like to get a little bit of leverage and a little bit of position, um, and then go to perpetuating the system because there's no other options in part, and then in other part, you know, like, I, I don't know what the personal deal is, but it happens. So I think it's not just about speaking truth to power and women being more, you know, like, in the power state, but, like, how do we um, come into that in a way that represents everybody's interest and how we invite you know, a diverse population, not just women, but, you know, however we're gender identified or whatever sexual orientation, it's not just women, it's, you know, it's race, it's gender orientation, it's like the entire panoply of diversity from my perspective. I think that's really going to get us where we want to go. Can I just, go ahead. I was just going to say, I just, yeah, I appreciate that and just feel like there's a, 
that's why so often these conversations feel to me like such great opportunities for every one of us to do the work and especially if we're doing it in psychedelic spaces to to sort of self-examine where we're complicit and regardless of you know, I'm a woman I've been complicit in patriarchy I've certainly benefited from my white privilege I have you know there's like we we're, none of us are innocent and it doesn't make us bad people it just gives us an opportunity to become better people so. um two two points I remember the first now hopefully I'll remember the second when the time comes um you know I hear a lot right now in the context of the me too movement and and various things that like that this is this is a new thing and we're just starting to talk about this um, but actually uh, against our will men women and rape which was considered one of the uh, most influential books of the 20th century was published in the 1970s by a feminist writer and um, actually women have been talking about in some ways what we're doing is not that it's not that it's not new like feminists have been working on this for five decades. Um, so, but they're women, many of them. Uh, so it, it, that's kind of the point, <laughs> you know? There's not the same currency and credibility. And um, I, you know, I wanna give a shout out to Kimberly Crenshaw who coined the, the term intersectionality and just in Washington Post had a piece come out. Um, intersectionality is the idea that um, when you have like, say you're a black woman, there's, there's ways in which we, you are marginalized from the black community as a woman and ways in which you are marginalized from the um, white dominated feminist movement because of your race. And so there's like this falling between the, the cracks potentially and an invisibility and a silencing that happens. This is from like 1992. Patricia Hill Collins, another amazing um, intersectional feminist thinker. So there's, there's um, a huge range that we get to kind of pull from um, and a lot of knowledge that's actually already been generated that we can, that we can rely on to strengthen ourselves and to, to keep showing up and, and kind of update the work for 2018 on drugs. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, too, that like, when we're thinking about, and maybe this is something, Catherine, that we can at the end, all the panelists can maybe think about um, contributing going over, when I'm thinking about what are the solutions here, um, if you are cognizant of the fact that you're benefiting from your white privilege, do every day your power to lift up the voices of, you know, these marginalized and these disenfranchised communities, you know? If a queer woman wants to be a researcher, help her. If a woman of color wants to be a therapist, help her. Like, we need to, in order to not continue um, being a part of this, you know, patriarchal system, we need to, like, actively work every single day on calling shit out and helping our sisters and brothers. We have to, like, help each other. You know, it, it's... Um, I feel frustrated sometimes because I feel like... Um, I've become like militant in the past like um, few months about um, calling shit out, and it's not enough, right? I have to also use my power and privilege the little that I have to help advance and lift the voices of those who um, aren't often left out of these conversations. So, I mean, the takeaway for me, if anyone in this room, if you're in a position of power, you know, do the work to help others um, be able to break out of our fucking miserable system. Yes, uh, since uh, one of the subjects of conversation here is research, I would like to suggest uh, a bit of research. Um, there was a group that came out of an organization that I used to work with in the early 60s. The organization was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I suggest that you uh, research and look for a, a women who, came, who were SNCC women. They were black women, they were largely black women, but there were also white women in there, and the name of their journal was Triple Jeopardy. Mm. This was before, and this was in the early 60s, before any discussion of intersectionality or anything like that. Mm. Triple Jeopardy, race, class, mm. and gender, and gender included sexuality at that time. So I, I strongly encourage you to um, add that to your sense of history in terms of this struggle. Thank you. Uh, I'm Thierry. Um, so thank you, all of you. You know, and uh, I was really moved. You know, like you know, by some of the stories I heard, particularly in a sense, like can I address somebody, like you know, and uh, 
what happened to you, but then when you say that, you know, what was, what was maybe even more painful was the, the lack of opportunity to be listened to, you know. And I remember, you know, like when I was in Africa, you know, I was five years old and being touched by a caretaker, you know, and, um, and feeling very strange about that. And um, mm-hmm. as a result, growing up, you know, trying to live my life to escape that memory, you know. And, uh, and I remember going back to Africa at the age of 22, at the time I had an addiction already that I picked up in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and this woman is sitting across me. And I had this murderous rage inside of me. I know that there's something wrong, you know. And, uh, and I remember going to my dad, to my mother, and um, and the idea, uh, no, this could not have happened, you know. And uh, it was a threat. It was a threat to them, you know. So like sitting in this room, you know, it becoming clear, at least in my opinion and in my own work experience, that you know, like you know, um, we know in this country that sending people to jail doesn't work, you know. What I'm seeing that, you know, there's a lot of sick motherfuckers, including me, you know what I mean? And people need, like, uh, healing, you know? I can just imagine, like, you know, those, uh, those healers in Africa, the woundedness, you know? And, uh, and the curse that they are passing down to their kids, you know? And uh, we just, like, you know, I just, we just need, like, you know, I feel like more healing, you know? I was talking to my mom, right, you know? My mom has been the, you know, has witnessed, you know, like, uh, violence as well. So I cannot help that, you know, to feel that the, the solution needs to be individual. I need to do the work personally, but the love needs to be collective, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know how to say it otherwise, you know. And uh, also to recognize my privilege, you know, to recognize my privilege that, you know, um, no matter how painful this was, you know, like I'm still, you know, I still have, you know, a lot of privilege, you know. And, uh, yes. The last thing I want to say is, you know, and um, it has been, you know, like, as a guy, you know, who went to college, you know, I did my feminist class and all that, you know, looking very, you know, thinking that like I'm so sexy and stuff, you know, it has been very painful, you know, to uh, to witness the extent, you know, of what actually happening in terms of patriarchy, you know, and uh, I have a niece who's three years old and I have a sister, I was talking to her about it and she said, Thierry, there was many times in Africa, some of my boyfriend were, you know, some of my boyfriend, I was really afraid of them, you know. And to know that this, you know, I'm the big brother, you know, I'm the big brother. And I'm my sister who were in the same house and they were this parallel universe, you know. One because she's a woman and one because I'm a guy, you know. So like, you know, and uh, so it's very painful, you know, to, to experience, you know. And uh, so hopefully I'll do something. Uh, I just um, wanted to bring one other point, and I think it's been subtly said, but it's often missed in this country, in the class, that um, regardless of, of you know where we might have even come from, um, those of us who have actual capital or access to cultural capital, um, we have to start to talk about this. This is the one conversation in America that will get diverted. Um, this is a racist country, no question about it. This is a racist country. This is a violent country. This is a, a patriarchal country. But the, a- the access to the medicines are primarily based on you know, whatever class fluidity we might have had or whatever class we were born into. And I think those voices that are silenced are often because of, of, of folks' class. So this we, you know, a lot of Americans think we don't have a class system. Um, I don't know if this audience thinks that. Um, the other thing I want, I just want to make two really quick points. Um, one is there's also a racism in the exotification, the exotifying of the other that somehow I'm going to go and have this experience and because this man or woman is indigenous, you know, from a different culture, that they will not have the same qualities, the noble savage. And it runs rampant throughout this, this community. And then I want to talk a little bit to Kevin's point. What we're talking about, where you talked about the, the connection between academics and the academic world in the ceremonial space, this is a structural issue. To me, I, 
um, I see like such a clear connection, a clear connection to a to a male dominated world from the from the boardroom to Hollywood to 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 the to the Maloka. It seems to me the exact same energy. And as a spiritual person and as a ceremonialist, I believe it is an energy. I believe it is an energy and an entity. And that we can we can resist this through what my brother Terry was talking about, through love, because I actually think that love is a revolutionary weapon, and I could break that down to you in terms of practicality. Love and openness, and also a clear analysis. So I'd be glad to talk to you about it, but for me, the connection is so, to me it's obvious. Um, and I'm not saying that it's obvious to everybody or that I, I've, you know, a lot of this information has been given to me, and I'm grateful for it. So. I think there's a direct correlation. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce a couple more facts. So I, I shared this at the Psychedelics and Race panel that we did it was over a year ago now. Um, when I took a look at some of the recent psilocybin studies and MDMA studies that have been funded by the structures and systems that we're talking about, um, over 90% of the research participants were white. Um, luckily, the ethics boards require 50-50 male-female representation, at least in a binary way, but it was shocking that every other study of a drug could easily recruit people who weren't white, but all of a sudden, when it's about psychedelics and healing, really, really hard to find those study participants. Even well, in, a, in Baltimore. Even in a city like Baltimore, <laughs> it's like 70% African-American. And so when people ask, you know, I get this question um, so far primarily from young privileged white men, which is, so you have male dominance, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are um, being discriminated against. And I can say for sure that it does. Um, I don't know all the solutions, but I do know that's the fact. And um, one of the things that I've tried to do, it's a small thing, but it's something, is there's a legal mushroom retreat center in Jamaica um, I have no long, no idea how long it will exist, how long the powers that be will allow something so crazy as a safe legal space for people to ingest a natural plant medicine to keep existing. Um, but for the time being, there's a nonprofit organization that helps provide full scholarships for people to go down there and receive healing. And it's a little bit ludicrous that people have to fly all the way to Jamaica to get access to natural mushrooms and that the psilocybin studies are being done with a synthetic chemical funded by billions of dollars from private individuals, mostly for white people and people in upper middle class situations. So, something that can be done, if you know someone who wants to go or you're the person who wants to make it possible for someone to go, please come find me. There are a couple um, flyers left over from the Crypto Psychedelic Conference, so you'll notice that you can donate in normal dollars or any form of crypto asset that you potentially have um, before it all crashes. <laughs> um, it's called pledge.org. The uh, center is called mycomeditations.com. Um, there are other examples of revolutionary things like this that exist within the system and they might just kind of come and go, but we have to really keep our eye out for them. And there's a way of supporting people who can't have access to the clinical treatments um, another related point that I want to bring up is that there are now for-profit companies trying to uh, create commodities out of synthetic psilocybin and also MDMA. Uh, there are also nonprofit organizations doing it a little bit better, but the power systems are very similar. Um, one of my favorite and respected colleagues is helping out one of these for-profit uh, corporations. Uh, whose investors are like some of the most terrible, nightmarish people you could ever imagine within the kind of corporate world structure. And this person said to me, I'm helping them because I think if I don't, it will be unethical, they'll do it anyway, and then people will be hurt. I get that. But he also said, I want to make sure that people in the inner city of Baltimore have access to psilocybin through Medicare. And I said, that's such a quaint notion because mushrooms grow everywhere and they don't need a system to tell them that they can access something for free through a government agency. But I think this is kind of like the brainwashing that we're dealing with, that some of us is obvious and to others it's just like, I'm helping the system because that's what we've got. And so it's kind of creating alternatives and creating options so that the experts feel like they can actually help the right people rather than just continually serving these overlords. 
you know, the people with the money, the people in positions of power because they've already succeeded in the business world. You know, it's like, let's kind of like take some of the veil away from this idea of idolizing the clinical researchers and these like philanthropic funders. It's not, it's not a pretty scene. It may still help a lot of people, but it's not pretty. Um, so with the little bit of time we have remaining, uh, I would love to hear closing statements from our panelists. <laughs> I've already made my closing statement. Um, Sita, do you want to go first? Sure. So I think my closing is a little bit of an endorsement of Dimitri's last statement, that this is an energy. It goes from the boardroom to the Maloka, for sure. I am, you know, one of a few women, currently some practitioners that I know, and I think that's a reflection of money and power, male dominance, who has access to the medicine, who can get on a plane and go to Peru and study for 10 years, and, you know, do all these things. So I, I do think all of these um, situations are a mirror of the um, white male power structure that's in place. I'm committed to shifting it. And I also second Ariana's um, invitation for us to help each other to do something, not just um, you know, complain, or, you know, but like to identify and dismantle and do what we need to do to um, create something different so that 100 years from now, the conversation is very different. Mm -hmm. Oriana, our faces are on the screen. Do you want to sure. say anything in the final remarks? Yeah. Um, you know, I want to thank everybody today for coming out. It was so cool to hear that it was sold out. Um, I hope that we can continue this conversation. Um, you know, uh, second, obviously, or thirding, I guess what I said, what Sita said, is, you know, how, making sure that we're um, helping to lift up the voices of people who um, are not, uh, you know, lifted. And um, I guess I'm going to make my ask very clear. If anyone in this room knows how I can get involved with an MDMA, you know, a psychedelic training program so that I can do this work, contact me. I've been trying for years, and somehow all of my allies and women friends and male, no, I've never, if somebody knows, I'm trying to get on a, a MAPS uh, training program so I can do this work. Um, that's my ask, personal ask. And the second thing I would leave you with is before donating any money to anyone, even people that I recommend to you, do your research, figure out what the board looks like, figure out who the men are that have started the nonprofit, um, do your work, because um, though I, I, I'm trustworthy, I, I think, I mean, you know, do, do your research always before you donate money. And thank you again for really showing up. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming and um, supporting these conversations. I feel like this is just a really first dive into something that has so much depth and uh, intersects with so many other topics. And, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I was recalling um, an experience that I had in, in Brazil where um, I... I felt impacted by the patriarchal way that the space was being held, both in terms of the, bin the gender binary and the constant reinforcement of that, and in terms of a sort of a very patriarchal lens on sexuality <clears throat> that was imposed upon my history um, as a sex worker. So, and I was thinking about just how many layers of this there are. I mean, we, we haven't even like scratched the surface of the things that we have to unpack, and um, yet. I do think that the first steps out of this can be so simple. Like I think that finding ways to be in circle and in ritual and in community with others in a way that doesn't require a, a guru or a guide and in which we hold space together for each other so that there is no space holder is a really simple way to start, start eliminating those power differentials. And that there's so many simple ways that we can start breaking out of these molds now. So I kind of try to hold on to that idea rather than being overwhelmed by all the ways in which we all can be very oppressed by the current system. So, thank you. Um, just want to thank everyone for coming. This was uh, a, a great event. Um, 
I guess, you know, I, I was thinking Bob Marley line, seems like total destruction is the only solution. Nobody can stop them now. Mm. And I don't say that as a nihilistic way of viewing the world. I don't think Bob was a nihilist. I think it is a create the Bakunin also said the urge to destroy is a creative urge. Um, I think we have some fertile soil in which we can plant. Um, uh, groups like this, what can we do? Groups like this, what can we do? Oriana said it's like challenge your own shit. If someone's giving you privilege, like I got the privilege really because, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't know why, but I can, I can do a panel in this fucking space. Do a panel. Do something. And I, if you want to have a psychedelic trip, challenge your own privilege. It gets uncomfortable. <laughs> your stomach hurts beforehand. <laughs> you ride through it. And then you might actually get something out of it at the end. And that's what it's about. It's about being in contribution. And and just to, to piggyback off of what you were saying, Rita, there's ways of holding space that are non. <laughs> there's ways of having space that are non hierarchical, and I think that, and there are. If we can talk, if you want to talk about it later, we can. There's ways of, of delivering these medicines with skills that are non hierarchical, and that's what we. That's what I feel we have to look at the hierarchy. We don't want to replace it with a matriarchy. I was in one, it was called the second grade, and it fucking sucked. Okay. So we want to be able to have direct access, and you know, I'm an anarchist, and I did this work for a while it, it, with direct action. I did it. I did it with other folks, and we made mistakes, and we try to learn from them. So I'm just really grateful, thanks. I think tolerance for mistakes is, is a big one here and learning how to say sorry and forgive me and sit with the like, oh man, I really screwed that one up. Um, what I want to say has to do with the, the tendency that I think a lot of us have, it takes quite a lot of unlearning um, to, to look at individuals and ask them, you know, to take responsibility for their healing or to take responsibility for overcoming the odds presented by their, their gender, race, or class. Um, and really, I think we, we would be better served to, um, to, to actually resist that and to start looking at the, the structural issues that are happening and to politicize this and to organize this and to um, kind of work that angle of it. Um, you know, I think about my story and how I was responded to and like, and that was quite public. What message did that send to other people that need help and need support? And that's not, that's not on me. That's not on me. Um, so, you know, to any survivors or victims that are in the room or that are, are watching this, it's not our fault and it's not on us to fix it. You know, we're, we're people like anybody else, but at the end of the day, this is a collective issue and it's time to get the weight off of our backs. Um, and, and start learning how to respond to one another um, with compassion and to also take the hurt that we feel when we hear stories of pain, oppression, and suffering and to politi politicize that shit. Thank you, Willie, and I'm so happy we got you to come back at least for a short trip. <laughs> um, speaking of trips, please go to gofundme.com slash psychedelic dash patriarchy dash event. And that way we can raise some more money to help cover airfare, to help find new spaces that are more hope inclusive and non-hierarchical and maybe even find some patrons who are willing to make them free and low cost. Mm -hmm. uh, right now that's a bit of a daunting uh, feat in New York City is to find an actual physical space that is inclusive and not hierarchical and not owned and run by men and charging a lot of money. Um, we're very grateful for the space that exists right here tonight, but we can do a whole lot better and we can create real community physical spaces where people can go, not just for events and entertainment, but for real support, for psychedelic sanctuary, Places that are like a church and an emergency room combined and are open 24-7. So that's that's my vision. Um, let's see. Uh, there, Please take those safety tips that are printed out as you were coming in. You probably missed them, but pick them up, hand them out, give them to friends of yours. Um, we didn't think about an easy way to do this, but we don't have access to the email list from this, this ticketing event. So if you want us to contact you with follow-up information, please let's just pick one of those safety tip sheets and we'll write on the back of it. Anyone can add their email. If there's some enterprising person in the room who wants to 
collect email addresses addresses that would be awesome um oh i'm facilitating a women's retreat in march so um, again a very little thing that i can do but to create a space that's all women and people who identify as women biological or otherwise um, down in jamaica and yes it is a luxury it is a privilege it's very hard to get to but um, we're creating a really awesome safe place for women to process a lot of the issues we've talked about tonight um, i want to thank all of our panelists I think that we will look back on this moment as complicated and difficult and, and ugly as it was leading up to it and making emotional. it happen. And emotional as a pivotal turning point for our community and a moment where we all said that we can do this as grown-ups. We can grow up together and we can help each other and we can all admit when we're wrong and do a whole lot better. And so thank you all for being here to be witness and participate in this moment. And thank you, Catherine, for all the hard work you did.